this is our agenda for today. The workshop is computational thinking, seeing patterns. And we're going to be talking about computational thinking practices and then focusing in on, on the practice uh, of seeing patterns and um, talk about how you can work with young people and get them in, involved in thinking about some real data, which is important in terms of computational thinking, but also in other areas of STEM as well. So that's kind of our focus today. We'll talk about um, reflecting and processing learning experiences as well as a, a way to really make those the experiences that kids have with computational thinking and computer science meaningful and something that they can connect to other parts of their life. So this is kind of what we're hoping to accomplish today and our agenda. We'll come back to this at the end and see if we're able to get this. Are there any questions before we get started? You can unmute or just type in the chat. Okay, thank you again for joining us. Pattern recognition is one of the four practices of computational thinking and an important component in computer science. In the context we're talking about it, pattern recognition involves finding patterns among small decomposed problems that will help solve more complex problems. But what else comes to mind when you think about patterns and pattern recognition? I see we have several 4-H educators on today. And um, thinking about the work that you do with youth, where do you encounter patterns? What are some things that come to mind? I think for me, uh, and I'll, I'll say it because somebody will probably type it in the chat, anybody, but anyway, but quilting it is a, a, way, a place where I think about patterns and math. There's a, a lot of patterning that goes into to quilting and pattern recognition as part of that the process of putting together a quilt. Are there other ideas? Enrollment, I, I like that one. The, it's something we have to do every year and there's a pattern, there's a rhythm to it that we have to follow the steps and they have to be in the right order too. A dictionary definition of patterns is a repeated decorative design or an example for others to follow. What other patterns do we encounter in day-to-day -day life? And when we were chatting before, we were talking about Pi Day and, and uh, uh, lamenting the, at least for me, I missed actually making a pie or enjoying pie on Pi Day on Monday. But there's a lot of patterns that we look for in, in math and that relationship between the radius of a circle and the circumference of a circle that, that goes with um, March 14th and Pi Day as an example, art. And design is another good example. Thanks, Angela. So I think we've got, we're kind of focused in a little bit on what a pattern is and where we can see patterns. Um, patterns in nature, I like that. Um, I'm thinking, uh, right now about trees and the patterns that different trees have in, in their leaf structure and, and that being that recognizing the pattern of, of the leaves of a tree is one of the ways that we can identify what tree it is. Um, so, so we've got some good ideas about where patterns interact with our life. In terms of computational thinking then, it's part of this process of understanding a problem 
breaking the problem down into smaller, easier to solve problems. That's what decomposition usually means is breaking it into smaller pieces. Looking for similarities and differences is a way to identify better what you need to do to solve that problem. And then thinking about how we can abstract, take a specific example or a specific solution and make it more general, how we can ignore some parts of the pattern that are, are significant because they repeat and they don't need to be addressed or because they don't repeat. All of those are part of that process. And then an algorithm, or I think about a recipe often as an algorithm, is the steps, the process that you're going to follow. <coughs> Excuse me. We will be talking today about pattern matching in the context of computational thinking. But understanding and recognizing patterns is important in other areas also. Um, literacy is particularly important. Um, I was just reading with a first grader last week and she's still really struggling with, with her, her sight words and her reading speed and fluency is really hard still because she's not recognizing the patterns of words that should be familiar, will be familiar to her, like the is not something that she'll need to always sound out. She'll start recognizing those patterns in, in our language, our patterns in our mathematical thinking that make um, fluency a little bit easier, that make it easier as we go through life daily, trying to find things, trying to think through problems, trying to recognize people. All of those places are, are where we're using patterns. And when we use patterns to solve problems in a day-to-day -day situation, that opens up the possibility that a computer scientist can program a device to use pattern recognition in a similar way to help us be more efficient in that. And I think, Ann, I'm gonna turn it over to you with that introduction to take us into the next part of our activity. All right, thank you. So the next part of our activity is doing a hands-on activity about artificial intelligence. And so to get us thinking about that, I am wondering what do you think of when you hear the term artificial intelligence? And you can either unmute and talk or you can type in the chat box. What is, comes to mind when you think of artificial intelligence? Hey, a couple of people have said computers. That's definitely something that comes to mind for me as well. What else comes to mind? Is there anything besides computers when you think of artificial intelligence or a specific computer? Um, if you know, one of the things that came to mind for me is Alexa, um, because you know that's so widely advertised. And so that would be a type of AI. Jessica said a way of programming a computer to make its own decisions. That's a very good definition. Robots are another thing that um, I, I think of and associate with AI. So some of the specific AI types are on the slide that Sandra has up. Um, some famous examples of AI include IBM's Deep Blue or Watson. And Deep Blue was the first AI to be a human grandmaster chess player. And Watson beat the Jeopardy game show champion. And so those were two examples. I remember them being in the news when they were first done. Um, another example is a chat bot that you can have a conversation with on your company's website, or you have them pop up as soon as you get onto a website and you're trying to order something. Uh, and in-home systems like Alexa or Siri are other examples. And then another kind of AI are spam filters that you probably all have on your email that keep unwanted emails out of your inbox. Today, most of us interact with a lot of AIs every single day without even realizing it. Now we're going to do a hands-on activity from the 2018 National Youth Science Day Challenge called Code Your World. And the activity is called Artificial Intelligence and it begins on page 30 of the facilitator's guide. 
You don't need to have a guide today, but I wanted to be sure that you can do the activity with youth if you'd like it. So Sandra is going to put uh, the link in the chat box for you if you want to go download that if you don't have it already. And this is a hands-on part of the workshop. So you will want to have a pen, a coin, and a dice, and preferably a printout of the AI worksheet ready. So if you don't have those yet, you might want to go around those up quick. Uh, this activity defines artificial intelligence as something that can make rational decisions, exactly what Jessica was saying. And it usually is when solving one specific kind of problem. So most AI systems are built using computers, but an AI is anything that can make a decision. So you can make one out of anything that follows rules to make choices. So in this activity, you will teach kids the basic decision-making principles of AI and discuss some applications of AI in commonly used technologies. And learners will use rock, paper, scissors to compare two non-computer AIs and evaluate how well the AIs function. So we'll divide it up into breakout rooms to play the games and collect data, just as you would have youth play the game in small groups of two. And we're actually gonna put you into groups of three, just so it goes a little quicker, but youth um, in the activity are in groups of two. And then we'll use the data that we collect to think about pattern recognition. So first, we will play rock, paper, scissors and collect data. Then we'll all come back together. So can someone explain how the game rock, paper, scissors works? Hopefully you all play this as children. If not, we will explain it for those who've never have. Has nobody played this as a child or as an adult? Yeah, um, it's the hand is a fist is a rock. Mm -hmm. This is scissors, and then paper is your hand. Your just your hand over the top. So, and if I remember right, rock defeats scissors, paper defeats rock, and what else? What's the other one? Scissors. Yeah, that defeats uh, paper, so. Correct. So when you played it as kids, you usually said like one, two, three, shoot, or one, two, three, and then you both made your, your symbol and then mm -hmm. saw who won. So there's three options in rock, paper, scissors, the paper, the scissors, and the rock. So we're going to put you into breakout rooms and we want you to play at least three rounds of rock, paper, scissors, as two humans. So if Angela is in one group and Terry is in another group and Emily's in a third group in that group as well, Angela and Terry would play one round and then Angela and Emily would play one round and then Terry and Emily. So you each get a chance to try it and see how it works and um, just have that experience so that you can see how you're choosing those different things without maybe knowing each other. Then after that, we want you to have one person be the recorder, which is going to record the data. One person is going to be the human, and they're going to play against the third person, which is the AI. And take turns and rotate this. So you wanna collect 15 rounds of data using the dice and 15 rounds of data using the coin. So if you wanna do five times um, Angela and Terry play, and then five times Emily and Terry play, rotate that however you wanna do that. Um, and then make sure that you do 15 rounds of the dice and 15 rounds of the coin, which is what your worksheet shows you on the first page. Just have those all filled in. And then you'll notice that the instructions for the coin flip are for the wooden coin in the Code Your World kit, and you will have to adapt them for a regular coin. And so we have that, we've just randomly assigned one side to be heads and one side to be tails, and that's on the bottom left corner of your worksheets and you can see how uh, you need to figure out which one is rock, paper, and scissors. Um, use the AI worksheet or a blank sheet of paper to record your data. And before you leave your breakout room, make sure each person has their own complete data record. So when you're done with 15 times of flipping a coin, you'll just need to make sure that you get other, the other people's data and make sure you have all 15 of your coin flips and all 15 of your dice filled out on your sheet because we're gonna go into different breakout rooms 
for the second part of the activity. And so you all need your own complete data record. So do you think it's easier to play rock, paper, scissors against another person or against an AI? And why do you think that? And you can either type it in the chat or you can unmute and talk. Well, playing the human version, um, it was hard to keep the timing on, of course, the Zoom is delayed a little bit. So keeping the timing so that you were both sharing your sign at that particular moment. Uh, so that was kind of a challenge, but I know that I always call it creative cheating when I'm with kids that, you know, kind of cheat to win uh, when you're playing face-to-face because -face, you can kind of be a little bit of a delay and, and get that figured out. So, but playing with the dice and the coin, you were kind of stuck and uh, you know you you were committed to whatever it was that you rolled. <laughs> so. That's true. Are there any other observations about the differences? I definitely think about the delay because I have three brothers and we played this once in a while when I was a kid. And I had one brother that always wanted to delay just a second because he could think really fast and flip his hand gesture so that it looked like he was doing the one that was always going to beat you but it wasn't actually the one he was originally gonna do, so. All right, so the other question that I have for you is how many possibilities were there for a dice roll? So thinking about your dice, how many possibilities can you roll on a dice? Is it six? <laughs> mm -hmm. Six is correct. And so then how many possibilities are there for the coin toss? Only those two. Right, there's only two for the coin toss, six for the dice, and then how many options are you, how, do you have in rock, paper, scissors? Three. Right, so how did that affect your game, do you think? Or did it affect your game? I wouldn't say it necessarily negatively infect our infected our group but trying to figure out the dice chart um right off the bat I wasn't correct because I was when I looked at it I was thinking one through four is rock or two through five is paper um and not one or four or two or five so once we came to that realization we figured out that I had a couple I needed to change but that's true because otherwise you would have had overlapping ones um yeah. and we assigned um the game assigned numbers to each of your options. So you had two, two possibilities of getting a rock, two possibilities of getting a scissors, two possibilities of getting a paper with the dice. Once you figured out how to read the chart right, is there anything else that you noticed? Well, with the coin, you had extra work if you yep. had a pail, so you had to re-roll again. Um, to find out what your number was or what your sign. Correct. Yeah, so you were doing twice as much work on every roll when you got a uh, tail, I believe. Um, and the other one, you're just done. You got your rock and you figured it out and you moved on. So computer scientists might write code to have two computer-based artificial intelligences play against each other in this game or something else billions of times and record and analyze the data very quickly using, using a computer program. Now we're going to move into data analysis. And so we're going to combine the data from the different groups collected as they flip coins and roll their dice to get larger data sets, because the larger the data set, typically the more um, stable it is or the, the easier it is to, to have it repeat itself again. Then we'll look at the combined data to see if there are any patterns. So you may already have noticed some patterns in looking at your own data. We'll see if those patterns hold true when we get the other group's information. So we're going to stay in one breakout room since there's only um, six of us and Sandra and myself, and we'll just stay here and combine the groups, two groups data and see if you had any differences between them. So Sandra has the um, analysis part of the worksheet up so that we can just um, hopefully fill that out together. And so 
are you going, do you want to do that on a uh, slide, Sandra, or are you going to do it? Yeah. All right. So we're going to put the information in here. So since your data should be the same between the two groups, if you just want to have one of your, um, one person from each group speak, they can tell us what your data is, and then we'll just multiply by three. Does that work for you, Sandra? We, we can just add it together. So okay. we just need to know how many times one was rolled and we'll get, we can add all our numbers together. So yeah, just tell me a number and I'll fit it in there. All right. So you need to count how many times each of your results appeared in your data set and then we'll add those all together. And then we'll determine the percentages and we have a formula for doing that that we'll show you if you don't know how to determine percentages. And then um, we'll figure out the coin flips after we're done with the dice rolls. So we'll do those first. So whenever you have them calculated, you just say them out loud or put them in the chat and I'll tell them to Sandra. So I rolled one three times in my data set. Um, I rolled one once in my data set. Okay. Does the other group have their numbers of one figured out the times they rolled a one? I think our group, I don't know if anybody shared, I think our group had one three times. We rolled them 16, just to let you know. Okay. Yeah, that's so, fine. So we'll just, we'll figure that 15, 31, 34 rolls total then, Sandra? Or did you roll more than three? You rolled more than three times, didn't you? You rolled a full 15? But I think we only have one was rolled seven times when we combine everybody's data together. Three plus three right. plus one. Yep. So that's what I need here. Okay. Okay. And then how many times were the number was the number four rolled in your groups? Ours was five. Okay. Oh wait. That was wrong. I never rolled it. You never rolled it? No. Okay. And what about the other group? Somebody have it totaled for the second group? I think Angela was room two. So room one is what we need the totals for. Okay. I apologize. Sorry, my computer was having malfunction, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, oh, that's all right. I, you're looking for four. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I didn't, I didn't add up our team totals, but I didn't have four at all. Okay. Yeah. So five for the total on that, Sandra. Okay. So that would be 12 for the number of times the AI chose rock. Okay. And then the number of times that two is rolled. Our group had two. Okay. 
Um, I didn't roll two at all out of group one, but I'm not sure if my teammates did. Yeah, okay. for group group one, we had one, two. Perfect. Okay. And I have four, so that puts us at seven. Is that right? Yep, that makes seven times four, two. All right, and what about five? We had two. Okay. We had one. Okay, and Sandra, what'd you have? I had one. Okay, that's five for that. So that's 12 times that the AI chose paper. All right, and then the number of times three was rolled. Two for our group. Okay. Seven for our group. Okay. And I have three. Okay, so that's 12 times for the number three roll and the times the number six was rolled. Two again. <laughs> okay. Three in our group. Okay. And I have four. Oh, no, four, sorry. All right, I so, one. Four. so that was 10. So 22 times that the AI chose scissors. And that's a total of 46 times that the dice was rolled and we have all the options accounted for. So do you wanna do the percentages next, Sandra? Um, let's go ahead and do the totals for the coin flip and then come back to the percentages so I can go back to the other slide. Okay. So now we're doing how many times did your AI choose rock on the coin flip? Our group was eight. Okay. We had a little bit of a rocky start and get to didn't get to the coin flips. We only had the dice. That's okay. okay. I had seven, so that gives us fifteen. Eight. All right. And how many times did the AI choose paper for your groups? Two. Six. Two and six, so that's eight. And how many times did it choose scissors? Two. Six. Okay. And six for you, Sandra? Yeah, all that. The shared data is much more what I expected than my small group was of doing it myself. <laughs> all right, so that's 31 total rolls, which is right because you your group rolled 16 times instead of 15. So we have the complete data set for that as well. So if you want to go back to the other slide, Sandra, and we'll talk about this. All right. So if anybody enjoys doing math, you are more than welcome to do the math for this. Um, so the formula is, is right in the chalkboard area for calculating a percentage. So divide the parts by the whole and then times 100%. So does anybody have a percentage for how often the AI chose a rock when you were rolling a dice? So you would have 12 times out of that it chose it, which would be the part divided by 46, which is a total number of rules. And if you have a calculator, you are more than welcome to use this. You don't have to do this longhand. Use your phone or calculator on your computer. And you can type it, your answer in the chat, or you are welcome to just say it out loud. Is it 26%? Is that what? Yes, that's what I have. So it's a little, just a hair over 26%. So then, how many times did the AI choose paper since it's 12 also? That would be 26% as well. And so then how many times did the AI choose scissors for the dice when it had 22 out of the 46 rolls? You can round it up to 48% if you wanted to. Right, yeah, 48 makes it nice and clean. So. 
almost half of the times um, your AI chose scissors when it was rolling the dice. So now let's go down and calculate the percentages for the coin flips. So how many times did your AI choose rock? It was 15 times total and you had 31 total rolls. So what's the percentage for that one? I think I'm getting 48. Is anybody else getting that? Yep, I had 48.4. If you want to round it up and go, or keep it at 48, that's fine. Um, and then it rolled paper and scissors the same number of times, which is eight. So eight divided by 31. What is the percentage for both of those times? They were rolled for paper and scissors. Uh, you could round it up to 26, I believe. Yep, it was 25.8 to be exact. And so rounding it up to about 26, so about 26% of the time when you flipped a coin, your AI was choosing paper and it was choosing scissors, but about half the time it chose the rock. What I find really interesting in the results is that for the dice, you rolled about 26% of the time, you were rolling numbers that chose rock and about 26% of the time you were rolling numbers that chose paper but about half the time, almost half the time, you were choose, it was rolling numbers that chose scissors. So that is an interesting result considering rules of probability. So let's just discuss this for a little bit. Uh, why do you think that we got the percentages that we did for each of these different ways of rolling from dice and coin flips? And you mentioned that it was surprising to you. Can you explain what you were surprised by there? Sure. If you, I, I enjoy math. If you look at the, the number of times that you could possibly roll a rock, a paper, or a scissors with dice, you have equal probability of rolling it. So you should, in theory, unless you have loaded dice, roll about 33% of the time, you would roll a rock. 33% of the time you'd roll paper, 33% of the time you'd roll scissors. But our, our data is obviously completely different than that because you're rolling only about a quarter of the time for two of them and almost half the time for the third. But when you look at the coin flip, the coin flip had only two options initially, a head and a tails. So you have about a 50% probability that you would roll a head or a tails on each flip of a coin, which means that your rock, you should get about half the time because that's about how coin flips work. Then you have to divide your, the tails part of your rock to have the paper and the scissors. And so with two rolls, you're decreasing the chance that you're going to get two tails or a tail and a head. And so those should drop down to about a quarter of the time that you roll them. So the data for the coin flips is what I would expect because of that time that you have to roll the second time for your data. Uh, but the, the dice is not the way that it should have turned out by probability because you should have rolled the, each of those numbers approximately the same amount of times. So that's why I find the data interesting. Mm -hmm. And we would expect that if we had a larger data set, we would get closer to what that expected probability was, that if we had time to get even more data that we would get closer to about a third of the time would be rock and a third paper and a third scissors with the dice rolls. But even if we did a lot more coin flips, we'd probably come out with about the same percentages for the coin flips as we have now, mm -hmm. is what we would expect. So I have a quick question about the coin yeah. flips. Um, yeah. Since, you know, if you flip like the, the tail for like the first flip and then you have to flip again, is that still just counting it totally as one flip, even though you're actually flipping twice to get your, your actual result? 
Yes, that's the way that's the way it's figured um, because you're only coming up with one option. So you it takes you two flips to get to your choice instead of one flip to get to the rock. Because if you roll the heads the first time you flip the coin, you get to rock and then that you're done. But if you flip the tails to create those three choices, you now have to flip a second time to figure out which choice you're going to get. And so it changes the probability of how many times you're going to get each option. Right, but like when you're doing the data collection, you know, like in the mm -hmm. sheet, you know, it's it's basically counting that as one flip because there's not like what the flip meant only gives you the option of like rock, paper, or scissors, not yes. to flip again. Okay. Right. Yeah. And your students don't need to record the number of flips that way because it, it's not helpful for this particular data set since you're trying to, to divide it three ways. And so just knowing I had rock seven times, I had paper five times, I had scissors the rest of the time is the data that's helpful in this because that gives you the information you would need to eventually develop an algorithm to make a fairer AI, which is the last half of this activity that we don't get into today. But that's what you're collecting your data for is to try and figure out how can I write an algorithm that will make a fairer AI? Because in theory, your AI with your coins shouldn't have been very fair because it does, it, you hit the two choices less often than you roll the one flip for the rock. But in the dice, it should have been pretty fair because you had six choices that you were dividing into three. And so it still should have been a more fair AI which is why it's interesting that the data didn't show up that, show up that way. Are there any other questions about that? That was a very good question. And something that is worth explaining to your students because there would be students confused about that and how to record that. So what patterns did you see in your data or what patterns did you see as we put all of our data together that you noticed? And your students can come up with a lot of different things um, and a lot of different observations on this because there's a lot of different ways to look at this information. So just what are you noticing? We already talked about how the numbers we got with the dice didn't match what we expected. That I think mm -hmm. that was an interesting pattern there. And I know I went back and looked at our groups. We were usually rock was our pattern, was our high on all of them. The other ones were a little bit the other way. They were lower, I should say. So rock yeah. was the high number for both of the dice as well as the coin. And you notice with Sondra having a data set and room one having a data set, it was enough data that it skewed or changed your results in when you put it all together because you had more data to analyze it differently. But that was a good observation, Angela. Anything else? All right, so then my question after looking at that is, did both AIs, and we've kind of already discussed this, but did both AIs make the same choices among the rock, paper, and scissors? And we've seen they didn't, but why do you think that is? And we've kind of touched on this already, but do you have anything you wanna to add to that? All right, so we won't get to the next part of the activity, but it, it does help youth by developing a different algorithm for a coin toss that would be more fair. And that's the last part of this activity. And that is in the National Youth Science Day um, link that we put up at the chat, top of the chat, uh, that you can look at and see the rest of it. 
And for today, we're focusing on the first parts of the activity because we specifically want to look at patterns. And I think this is a fun way to let youth do their own data collection, analysis, and pattern matching. So we were wondering, what do you think of the activity and do you have any suggestions to improve this activity for your students, for youth? All right, so next I'm gonna turn it over to Sandra and she's gonna talk a little bit about experiential learning. So I wanted to kind of follow up what um, Anne had uh, with reflecting on the activity, but kind of taking you from the role of being the learner, looking at the data and doing the pattern um, matching and analysis to thinking about it from the perspective of the facilitator. And for that, I wanted to introduce the experiential learning model. I noticed as we were doing introductions earlier that several of you may be familiar with this model. Um, it's used a, in a lot of 4-H programming, but the idea is that students learn best, develop meaningful understanding that they can apply in other situations best by experiencing an activity, sharing about their experience and processing that and then applying it. And that's what this general model is about for experiential learning. The experience that we had was the um, artificial intelligence activity. We shared that experience together. And Ann and I had a clear purpose, our intent about that activity to um, give you a chance, or to give the learners, in this case, you were the learners, a chance to um, work with some data collection and, and look for those patterns. And then as we were sharing our experience, as we were bringing data together, talking about what we saw in those patterns, we were exchanging different points of view on that experience. And that's where the get into the deeper meaning uh, of the experience. Actually, just playing rock, paper, scissors and doing the data collection doesn't really get to the point where we understand what the activity was about. It's when we get to the process where we're thinking about what happened and learners get a chance to share their experiences and to talk with each other where they start making sense of that experience. An experience in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to learning. So part of the art or the science of making this a learning experience is to really come up with those questions. And Ann and I spent quite a bit of time talking together ahead of time about what were the questions that we needed to ask in order to, to help process that experience and think about how then we can apply what we've learned into other areas. And we didn't even really get to the now what phase of our processing because we didn't ask those questions about how what you're learning about pattern matching in this activity can be applied in other areas, how you can take what you've learned and use that in different ways. And that's what the, that second part of the, or the third part of the processing is important for. But from the perspective of the facilitator, I want you to think about how much time did we spend in the activity doing the experience and how much time did we spend processing the experience? And um, what are your, your thoughts on that? What, how did we balance that time and did we balance that time well?
from a point of view of this particular activity, we had two people that had to leave. And so they've missed out on some of the processing uh, of the experience. And this is so typical of what happens in out of after, particularly in after school programming, that it, it's a lovely example, but it's a bit frustrating too, because for our overall learning goals, doing the probability activity, the artificial intelligence activity was just one piece of what we wanted you to experience because we wanted to be able to talk about how that fits with computational thinking. And yeah, Terry and Marguerite are, are missing out on that discussion. And it is so typical of what happens when we have the processing of the experience happens toward the end because you have to do it first before you can talk about it. So typical that we don't really get a chance to spend as much time processing the experience as we want to. And you know, we weren't sure how much time it would take to, to do the data collection and, and to talk about those patterns. Again, very typical of what happens in after school time that um, we ran out of time. We spent more time doing the hands-on part and, and didn't have as much time to talk about why that was important and what we wanted to take away from that. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you to do now is to open up your chat and think about, are there other ways that we can process the experience other than the sort of discussion that we had and did a good job asking questions that kind of directed our thoughts in, in particular ways, but what are some other ways that we can help youth process the experience? And some of that, in this case, if not everybody got through it, this may not be an, as important of a lesson, but if it was something really important, maybe you're gonna come back to it again later and do some more processing of that experience to make sure they really understand what we did. What are some other ways we could process the experience? I'll stop talking now and let you share some ideas. Might be beneficial to, I mean, now they don't have the whole experience yet, but to, you know, after like kind of maybe each segment of it, you know, have some discussion and like kind of go over some of that before going on to the next one. Like it's, again, not like the full experience, but then at least, you know, they're getting snippets of it to where, you know, maybe some of that's making a little bit more sense um, in the generalizing part, you know, even if they haven't completed the entire thing, um, just kind of maybe get those questions going in between. That's a great idea, Laura. And Emily has similar in, in the chat that, you know, maybe if we had gone through and, and looked at the numbers from the dice rolling and, and put those numbers together, did a little bit of talking about that before we went into doing the coin flips, that might have worked better and everybody would get a little bit of that processing and making sense of the data even if they had to leave early. I like that idea. Breaking it up into smaller parts. Sometimes we have a, an activity that Maybe there's something they can take away to share when they get home to help think about what happened with, with their parents at home. So if there's a, a handout that, you know, today in your after school program, we did this activity and this is what happened. Not everyone is going to be able to talk about that, but some parents might talk about it on their way home as they're driving home from the activity. 
maybe they can do a little bit of that processing there. Any other ideas? Have they played this game more than once? I mean, do it the first time and and then do it again, and that might help as well. Yeah, and some of that learning. Because I it's some of the, it's a, some of the, I haven't done some of the probability math for a long time, so I was like, oh, am I doing this right? <laughs> so. Yeah, having another way to apply it or, or doing it again, I like that. And are there other things that you could do on the same topic? I mean, I know that there's, um, you know, where you, another day you experience something very similar, um, not the same activity, but do building on top of it for them. And this one is geared at what age? I don't remember. I think this, I'd, I have to go back and look for sure, but I think this one was really targeting about a third to fourth grade okay. level uh, for the kids to be able to, um, do the summing themselves and, and maybe even find the averages themselves would, would have to be a little bit older elementary age student, I think. I'm going to move us on because um, we did want to come back to these computational thinking practices. And we had a video we wanted to watch together before we run out of time. So Anne, you wanna kind of wrap up the computational thinking, I'll get the video ready to share. Yes, so as we get ready to wrap up, we did wanna circle back to computational thinking practices. With computational thinking is a way of thinking in STEM and particularly computer science is where you see it used perhaps most often. And that's like the engineering design process. They both help youth solve problems in different ways. They're different ways of thinking about how to, to go about for solving a problem. And specifically, it is a process of devising solutions that a computer can execute. However, you don't have to use computers to learn about computational thinking practices. The strategy we explored today is pattern matching. And pattern matching describes the thinking practice of finding similarities or patterns between things. Before we finish up, does anybody have observations they want to share about computational thinking or pattern matching? And I will add on to that, what is the value of youth being able to find patterns? Or do you find any value in them being able to do this just as a skill in itself? I know for me, I'm a cross stitcher and being able to find patterns in cross stitching so I can use one thread and thread my needle and then go and find the, uh, my patterns of where things are at and kind of anticipate where I'm supposed to be stitching so I don't stitch in the wrong place is really helpful for me personally. Uh, does anybody have any other examples? I'm not sure how many students caught cross stitch. Well, I've been watching my niece lately. She's been at my house a couple of times on the weekend and she gets her Barbies out and she's all of a sudden sorting um, colors, um, the shoes, and, and then she'll say, I'm making a pattern. And I'm like, oh, you must be learning that word in school right now. <laughs> so um, to be able to make that connection, but that's, I mean, just watching her sort all of her toys. And I'm sure that many of you probably have watched in the after school sites as well, how kids play and how they put some of those patterns together. So that's kind of what my aha moment was is, watching her and how she, she plays and organizes. So maybe she'll be an organized child in a clean room in the future, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> well, and my daughter always had to sort her Legos. Uh, she always wanted them sorted by color and size. And before she ever built anything, they were all sorted out. And so uh, I think that different kids play in different ways, but I definitely think there's patterns in play. Um, so what other activities have you done that help youth explore patterns in computer science, if you have any? We wanted to give you the opportunity to share those with others or any links to sites that you have that you really think were good. 
so that you can come away with more resources if anyone has them. Why don't we have people think about that as we go into the video, because we are close to running out of time. We are. Yeah, we are. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share the video. But if you have resources to share, I'll include those when I send out notes to everybody, because we had a lot of people that registered but weren't able to attend today. So we want to share, share our, the experience with them as well. Computational thinking is one of the best tools that youth can have regardless of the career that they choose because it's a way to problem solve. A way to look at a problem, break it up into smaller pieces, look for patterns, and look for ways that they can use computational thinking to come about a solution. Increasingly, we're finding that computer science has become a new form of literacy that kids need to understand just the basics to be literate and doing lots of jobs and lots of opportunities. It's exciting because they love the technology and they want to engage with it and they're not afraid of it. And so they just want to explore and figure out new things and new ways of doing things, kind of pushing the limits to see what they can do in a program. Computer science is important as we look at the larger STEM fields because we want to create a, a STEM ecosystem that happens during school, out of school, summer programs, family nights. Those are all important to create the STEM ecosystem. The question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Kids often get asked that, and that's a scary, intimidating question. We don't want to tell kids what they have to be when they grow up, but we want to foster a career pathway thinking that lets them consider, if I want to pursue this type of career, what are the kinds of experiences that will help me learn more about it, gain the skills, and help me understand, do I want to go down this or not? So many industry, corporate, and military partners have come to us and said, we have a gap. We don't have enough qualified students and workers in this field because there's plenty of good jobs and jobs that are innovative and creative. That's what we need these uh, pathways for. All right, so what did you notice in the video? learning, which is that whole experience, and then hopefully debrief what they did. Mm -hmm. And how do you see young people that you work with benefiting from having these types of skills? Well, I think your ultimate goal is that they want to become involved in that future career. Uh, choice or get that, I mean, we're using the 4-H term of spark, sparking that interest and having them build on other things that they may be involved in as youth members all the way up through college and adult life. I think that's true. And even if they're not going into a career with computer science, these are still skills that they can use in other, in other areas. Um, Sandra and I were just talking about you know, even if you're an engineer, you still need to use a computer because that's how you build your models now. And it's not done with paper and pencil anymore with like architects used to do 100 years ago. Uh, so I am going to let Sandra close us out so we can get uh, finished up on time. Yeah, so I, I put a link in the chat. Please take a minute to complete the survey for us and um, give us some feedback really want to thank everyone for the ideas that you shared and I will make sure and follow up with the come from click to computer science and I'll share a link in the chat for you so you can find more of these resources. 
But um, mostly I want to thank you for being participants today and for helping us think through why it is important for all students to have experiences with um, computational thinking and 